Okay, is it working? Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay, let me ask you a question. Who has heard uh, about plasmonics? Who knows more or less what it is? Oh, I, I, okay, so I should keep 50% uh, of what I <laughs> prepared apparently. Um, anyway, uh, please ask questions at any time. Don't uh, hesitate in interrupting. Um, so here the idea is to, to discuss uh, quantum optics with surface plasmons. And uh, the, the motivation for that is um, as follows. The, here I have a, a sketch of uh, different domains of optics as a function of size. And here we have a characteristic length, which is the wavelength. And as a function of energy, and that's the quantum of energy. So quantum optics is on the left side. Wave optics, geometrical optics, classical optics is on the right side. In terms of diffraction limit, this is nanophotonics. This is quantum optics and wave optics. So the goal is to be in this area. So small and low energy. So why would you like to do that? Not because it's more difficult. Uh, there are a, main, uh, a number of reasons and motivations to do that. One obvious one is if it's small, then you can do uh, quantum optics on a chip. So you can go to some practical device. At the end of the day, whenever you develop a, a tech new technology, it has to end in some small device for, for just because it has to be cheap and practical. So, so that's one motivation. It's not the main motivation. Uh, then there's new physics. One of the most uh, amazing thing is nonlinear optics with few photons. So as you know, nonlinear optics is, uh, this is key for many technologies. You can generate wave, wavelengths with lasers that if you don't have lasers, you can just mix wavelengths. You can do second harmonic generation. You all the logic systems are based on nonlinear behaviors. So, so this is a, a, a fundamental part of optics. And of course, when you want to do nonlinear optics, you, you need to generate uh, a nonlinear polarization. And this nonlinear polarization, usually, you need uh, high fields just because your polarization, say, component I of polarization, usually you have some chi I G. Uh, and this is your linear relation with the field. And if you want a nonlinear, you need to expand. And you need a second order term. And of course, if it turns out that this term is much smaller than this one, so that's why at low intensity you don't have nonlinear effects. So what, what do you do? You replace your, your light source by a powerful laser and you focus the laser so that you make sure that your field is large. And essentially, before laser, there was no nonlinear optics. And this has been the case for many, many, a very long time. And now with nanophotonics, it turns out that you don't need a laser for doing that. And the only way is this. The, the basic idea is that if you can confine in a small box small volume, say, a photon, then as you know, the electromagnetic energy, electrical energy, in this volume is the volume times epsilon e square over 2 and the magnetic part. So you see that the electric field is essentially the electromagnetic energy, let me call that U so that we avoid confusion, divided by the volume. So from this you see that if you have a single photon, then your energy is 2h bar omega. It cannot be less than that. But if you manage to confine this single photon in a tiny volume, you can end up with a huge electric field. And even if you have only one or two photons, this field can reach the saturation field 
of a two-level system. So you can saturate an atom with two photons. So this is something that, of course, is totally new, uh, coming from standard optics. And uh, uh, with, with that, of course, you, you can imagine to have logical systems with very few photons and therefore few energy. So potentially, this is good news if you want to save energy and still use optics, okay? So uh, th this is something really new. Now, you need to learn how to confine the photon in a small volume, and that's where plasmonics is useful. So then I'm going to explain why plasmonics allows you to confine fields. Uh, something else uh, that is extremely important is to control light-matter interaction at the single emitter level. So that means that you, you can do many things. You can control spontaneous emission. You can control the direction of emission. So this directivity, for instance, you can mimic this Yagi Uda antenna. You know, those are the antennas that are or used to be on the roofs for TV sets. And uh, this, those are nanorods, gold nanorods, which are mimicking these directors. And this is called reflector, this one, which is here, it's larger. And uh, instead of having a cable, which is exciting one of these wires, here we have a quantum dot, which is a two-level system. You can model as a two-level system, which is exciting the uh, currents here, the modes, electromagnetic modes sustained by these gold structures. Um, this is another example of resonator. We'll be discussing this. It's a core shell structure. Uh, and with that, you can, uh, like I said, control directivity, control the emission of polarization, control the lifetime. You can reduce the lifetime of the emitter. And you can enhance uh, absorption phenomena, fluorescence, uh, Raman, uh, uh, and so on. So, so that's uh, the program. Uh, that's the motivation. So let's see. Let's go to quantum plasmonics. So first things, I'll show you what is a plasmon to try to then be able to explain why you can confine light with plasmons. So here is the drawing of the plasmon. So actually, when you say surface plasmon, depending on who you are talking to, it could be a localized plasmon or it could be a propagating plasmon. So this is an uh, infinite extended mode. It's like a plane, two-dimensional plane wave. Localized, uh, so this is Z. So it's localized exponentially decaying along Z. Here it's the skin depth in the metal, and here we will see what it is. Uh, you have a confinement here in vacuum. Um, if you have a, a, a tiny particle, then all the electrons are moving together, and you have essentially a, a collective movement of the electrons, uh, and that produces, if all the electrons are going down, that produces a surface charge here a negative surface charge, and therefore, since the electrons left, you, you are left with a positive charge due to the jellium, the, the background, positive background of the crystal. Okay, so both of those are called surface plasmons. Those are, bo both are really surface charge, so, so you really have indeed charges, but they are really surface charge. By surface, I mean they exist in about an angstrom, uh, and uh, they do not penetrate here. Um, now, I just mentioned that here we have an exponential decay. Let me explain just from that formula where it's coming from. We are looking for, like I said, kind of two-dimensional plane waves propagating along the interface. So just like it's written here. Now, the electromagnetic field of, of this mode, which is schematically shown here, if you look at the electromagnetic field here in vacuum, it has to satisfy propagation equation in vacuum. If it's monochromatic, then it has to satisfy the Helmholtz equation in vacuum. So if you plug this form into this, you get minus K2 minus gamma square. So gamma here is used for the Z component of the electromagnetic field plus omega square over C square. So this is, of course, the dispersion relation 
in vacuum, nothing fancy. But you see that the z component of the wave vector here is given by So clearly, if k is larger than omega over c, this is negative. So this gamma is pure imaginary. And if it's pure imaginary, it's an evanescent wave. So the decay length I was alluding to is given by this. So you clearly see here that gamma is i modulus of the square root of uh, k square minus omega square over c square, which is the modulus. So it's a pure imaginary, assuming this k is real here. And uh, uh, the if, now, some, this is very important, if, no, this is a bad choice, if k is much larger than omega over c, wha what does it mean? I'm talking about high spatial frequencies. So what are those high special frequencies useful for? If you want to describe a highly confined field, very tiny structure in space, huge frequencies in K space, okay? So if we are talking about real confinement in space, really small structures, then when you fully analyze the field, it has large K. Just like for time, uh, when you have musics, if you have, uh, high frequencies, then you have uh, very, very fast variations of the signal in time. So just the same, very large K, then you can just neglect omega over C, and you see that gamma is essentially IK. So that gives you the length scale, and that tells you that the larger K along this direction, the more confined the field. If you have many Ks, you see that being here, or here, or here, changing z means that you are choosing what is your kata frequency in k. Okay, if you decide to look at the field at a given z, then you can call this, d this one of a z, you can call it cutoff in k. As you move away, you lose the high frequencies. So it's a low pass filter. So distance is a low pass filter. So with that in mind, what is near field? Near field is when I get something additional from the standard stuff. The standard stuff is diffraction limit, 2 pi over lambda. So if k is, if I, can, if I want to get k larger than 2 pi over lambda, then I need to be closer to the source, to the field, to the object, within distances smaller than, and the, th that's the relation between the cutoff and the distance. It's written here, okay? So if you want to look at the length scale, which is lambda, you need to be closer, close to the object, to what you look, which has a length scale of lambda. You want to be closer than lambda divided by 2 pi, not lambda, because it's a k. So if you want to see some detail which has a length scale of 100 nanometers, you need to go closer than 15, 16 nanometers. Okay? Just because of that. That's all. It's very simple. That's fundamental. And that's the definition of near field. So near field is when you are within a distance which is given by this condition. Okay. I want to show you now that with these guys you can confine the field. And that's an example of uh, a metallic, um, metallic silver nanoparticle. It has a radius of 33 nanometers. It's illuminated at 368 nanometers because this is where there is a resonance of the plasma. And uh, what I'm showing here are the pointing vector lines. And uh, as you can see, 
they go to the particle. So this is a direct illustration of what Darik Chang has been talking about the fundamental dipolar absorption and extinction cross-section. Okay, it, it tells you that it's three lambda square over two pi. This is for an atom. For those particles, I will become in more details later. It's uh, slightly different. It's, uh, there is a factor of two. So the maximum extinction cross-section is because there are losses. Because you have losses, your the, the, the resonance, the quality factor is lower, of course, and therefore your extinction cross-section is lower. Uh, I want you to visualize that uh, this there is a distortion and, and that uh, although the particle is small, you are collecting energy over a much bigger area. And here you see that uh, o o it looks like this is the cross-section, but ac actually the, uh, the actual cross-section is much larger because as you can see the lines, the distance between the line is larger here than here, it's denser here, so that th this is carrying less energy. So the actual cross-section is really something like that, okay? So this is just to help you visualize what it means to have a tiny particle with a big cross-section. So we are really funneling the energy into this nano resonator. So this little guy is capturing this energy, and all the energy goes into the tiny volume, and therefore you have enhanced fields here. So what happens? We have the electrons going back and forth, and if you are here, you are very close to the charges, and the electric fields are enhanced. Okay, and it's just the funneling of the energy. And as I told you just before, energy per unit volume is electric field. So by concentrating the energy, you get high gain fields. Okay, the, the sphere is a very simple case. I, I want to show you some other examples. This is a triangle. Um, you may know that uh, chemists these days can synthesize perfect crystalline uh, structures like this one. This is 30 nanometers. There is no defect. It's a, it's a beautiful crystal and they can control the size uh, you can just ask them what size you want and they can do it for many materials. And uh, what you see here are the experimental measurements of spectrum. This is taken by ILS, Electron Energy Loss Spectroscopy. Those measurements were done in the group of Mathieu Kosiak in, in Paris. Mm. And uh, you can map for different energies uh, the, the distribution of the electric field, essentially and uh, you see that you see different types of modes. So th the key message, the take home message here is that the modes depends on the shape and by controlling the shape, you can control the structure of the modes, you can control the frequency and something else. Uh, I told you that because of this funneling mechanism, you are concentrating energy and therefore generating high fields. Here we learn something else you see that the field is very large here, uh, close to the tip. This is a lightning road effect. When, when you have a, a small radius of curvature in the electrostatics, the electric field goes like one over the radius of curvature. So here we have two uh, different uh, mechanisms that help producing a large electric field. So on one hand, we have a resonance so that all these electrons at a given frequency, which is this one, are oscillating resonantly, so that, that's one. And second, the shape is producing an additional mechanism here due to this lightning rod effect. Okay? So this is a second trick to try to locally enhance the field. That means that the, uh, the field of the mode is particularly large uh, at that particular point. Yes? If I change the frequency, I can miss the resonance, so no. there is If you increase the energy, what do you mean? The frequency, the energy of a photon, or, or the number of photons of the energy of a beam? Yes, at three different frequencies. Yep. 
No, 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 no. Um, so th th here we have a resonance which corresponds to a given uh, particular frequency. So this is the really the existence of the plasmons. And uh, uh, I will show that there are some conditions on the dielectric constant. So whenever you go away from this type of energy, you don't have any more plasmons. So, so you lose this plasmon resonance. No, 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 not at all. You will. So this is something else that you can do. Um, uh, you can play tricks with two particles, and you have coupled modes of these two. Uh, and this you are controlling an extremely small volume here, uh, and this extremely small volume allows you to generate uh, extremely large enhancements. So this number here is the intensity enhancement. So you, you see that by shining a plane wave with intensity one, you can locally end up with an several orders of magnitude, more than three orders of magnitude enhancement in the intensity. So this is the type of thing that you can do. Okay, this is the first picture. Uh, Little Prince was asking for a picture. This is the first picture of, of a plasma. It was taken using near-field optical microscopy uh, 25 years ago. Uh, and the scheme is as follows. Here you have a glass prism. This is a layer of gold, typically 20, 30 nanometers of, of metal. By coming uh, in total internal reflection, you generate a large K. The plasmon is an evanescent wave, so necessarily this K has to be larger than omega over C. If you want to excite this guy, coming from here is impossible to excite because your K is smaller than omega over C. And the plasmon has a K larger than omega over C. That's why it's a surface wave. So if you want to excite it, what you do is that you go in the glass, so then you gain a factor n. Your modulus is n omega over c. So this modulus here is n omega over c. The projection is n omega over c cosine the angle. So there is an angle that will match with the plasma. Of course, if the thickness here is like a micron, because of the skin depths, it never makes it to this interface. The plasma exists here, and you are, you are ex coming from here. So you need to go through. So the typical thickness of this layer has to be on the order of the skin depth. It has to be typically 20, 30, 40 nanometers, which is typically the skin depth. Okay? That, that's how it works. This is called the Kretschmann configuration. This is the, the one of the most popular way of exciting plasmas, this type of propagating plasma. Questions? Okay, so that's an image. Uh, let you see, then I explain and I show it again. So what you are seeing here is a picture taken on a camera which is here. You make the image of this interface. And uh, what's happening during the movie is that this tip, which is an optical fiber with a tiny tip here, it's approaching the interface. So you have a tiny tip, which is approaching the interface. And uh, in the beginning, because this is only on the order of the skin depth, this is not opaque. So you can see through the metallic film, and you see the tiny tip, which is the tiny dot, which was here in the beginning. Now, as you approach, what happens? We see at the end, you see that. Those are plasmons propagating like that, plasmons propagating like that. Since they propagate on the interface, they illuminate some structures which were on the surface. So they are illuminated by plasmons, and then they scatter light, and they scatter light. So you are generating a plasmon, then it's scattered here, and it shines lights. So you can see it now, and you can image it. Okay, so this is why these guys show up. Okay, explain me why, as I approach, I excite more and more this surface plasma. Yep. Yes. And why I'm able to excite plasmas? So I'm coming here with the tip. 
So if I look in this plane, I have an electric field, which is, of course, bright here, uh, and basically nothing here. So if I look at the intensity of the incident field along this line, it's something like which is like a bright spot here. And this is highly localized because I can make a tiny hole. This tiny hole can be 20, 50 nanometers. So it can be sub-wavelength. So if I have a tiny distribution, at, so if this L, which is the size of the hull, is much smaller than the wavelength, are there evanescent waves here? This electric field, it's highly confined. It's highly confined just because I have a small optical fiber. It could be metallized. And then I have a tiny hole. So the, the, the distribution of the field, if it's small, could be with this hole, it could be something like that. So if here I have a function which is much smaller than the wavelength, if I make a Fourier analysis, I get large wave vectors. I have to, right? If you have a delta of Dirac, it's flat, and you have all, all of them, OK? So, so if I have large wave vectors, each of them is an evanescent wave. OK? But it's too far away, so it cannot excite the plasma. As I bring it close and close, as you said, you start exciting the plasma. So that's exactly what happened. So let's see it again. So this is what you see in the beginning, when it's far away. Then let's start approaching the tip. So it's an exponential as a function of d. As d decreases, the coupling increases exponentially. Well, exponentially, if I had only one of those, and most of the time people think in terms of plane waves because it's easy. It's the simplest solution you have at hand. But actually, it's certainly not exponential because I have plenty of them. And when you add plenty of those, you get something else. So it's certainly not exponential. Actually, I if it looks like a tiny dipole, well, what would be your guess? If it's a tiny hole, so we can pretend it's a dipole. So what's the special dependence of the electric field of a dipole? 1 over r cube. So that, that's a good guess, not an exponential. 1 over r cube, exactly. So 1 over z cube. That's the good guess. Most people will tell you, that's ah, an exponential. It's an evanescent wave. It's plasma. Now, this is just one component in a Fourier decomposition, but you have plenty of those. OK. So we can do uh, compact devices, I mentioned. And uh, uh, the, w one of the interesting things about plasmons is that you can have lines like that. And you see uh, this, this turning point here is remarkable because uh, if you have the optical fiber at home, you may know that uh, you don't, you'd need to avoid uh, making right angles in the corner because you lose energy you need to have a radius of curvature which is not too large. Okay, the, the structure of, of, of the optical cable is such that in principle you cannot have a radius of curvature too small. Um, this doesn't happen here. So this is one of the beautiful properties of guiding waves with uh, plasmons. You can have, uh, and that allows you to have much compact structures. Uh, it is needed because, on the other hand, as you can see, you have a beautiful signal here. And this is the length scale, 5 microns. And so at, when you are at 30 microns away, you see that there was a, a huge damping. So that's the, the main drawback of plasmons. It's metals, and you have plenty of losses. So, so the propagation lengths are never larger than, say, 100 microns. Yes? So I guess the Julio system are thermal? Uh, yes, exactly. It's Joule effect, basically, uh, and everything ends up into heat, absolutely. So it should mean like these very tiny structures, I guess, that the, like the power threshold needs, needs to be like super small for us to destroy the structure? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, you can put a lot of power, but you, you, uh, at the end of the day, you will melt uh, everything. Yes. OK, so I would like now to explain what is a plasma. And uh, um, to, for that, I start with the localized plasma. And uh, the simplest model I can think of is a small cube. Uh, so let's pretend this is a silver cube. And uh, what is yellow is the electrons, which is blue is the jellium, the positive background. And let's assume that all the electrons together, all packed, moved by a quantity x along this x axis. And uh, I want to give you a simple picture of why we have uh, an oscillation. And of course, the key uh, result is that the, there is a natural frequency oscillation, which is plasma frequency. And the beauty of that is that it's indivisible or near UV. So that's why it's useful for optics. One of the key ideas I want to, to put forward here is that uh, the equations I'm going to write are mechanical equations. I'm going to write Newton equation for an electron, which is considered to be a, a point-like particle with a mass m. Okay, this is Newton equation. So I'm doing classical mechanics here. And I'm just saying that there is a force, which is the electric field, and the, the charge is minus C, and that's valid for any electron inside this cube. So I'm writing this equation for any of those, and I just make the assumption that this, the movement is the same for all of them. OK, so I need to know what is the electric field. Well, the electric field is the field generated by this, which is a layer with a surface charge, or this one. So here I have a positive charge, here I have a negative charge, and those are our surface charge. What is the surface charge? Let's call surface charge sigma. Well, let, let me write the, the total charge in this blue area. So the total charge in the blue area, uh, which is positive, let's call it key plus. So this is the area, let's call the area A. X is the displacement, so Ax is the volume. I have n electrons per unit volume. So this is the total number of electrons, and uh, it's not electrons actually, it's positive charges, so it's uh, times E. And of course, you see that this bracket here is the surface charge. So I can introduce the concept of surface charge, it's A by sigma. Now, Using Gauss theorem, you probably remember that the field is given by sigma divided by 2 epsilon naught. If you don't, you can derive it immediately. Uh, so that would be the contribution to the electric field. Uh, so this, that's my system. So this positive layer here is generating a field like that and a field like that, which is given by this formula. So it's po I'm looking here, so it's a positive field. Of course, the guy here is generating also a field. The direction is opposite, but the charge is also opposite. So one is pulling, the other is pushing, but you add the two. So you end up with minus E times twice uh, sigma over two epsilon naught. So that's minus N E square x over epsilon zero. So finally, you see that you have a harmonic oscillator movement. Where this is the square of the plasma frequency. So with that, we have uh, an introduction to the concept of polariton. I've been writing mechanical equations. So I'm talking about a mechanical oscillator. Now this mechanical oscillator, of course, it entails, it generates an electric field. So if I look at the electric field, now I can also think in terms of electromagnetic fields. Uh, and then I would uh, see that I have, th there is an electric field which is oscillating here. So, so it's both an electric field, an electromagnetic oscillator. I have an oscillating electric field. And it's a mechanical oscillator. 
which is due to the polarization of the material. Okay, uh, uh, in this figure here, I have a polarization vector. It's a displacement. So that's what is the polariton. It's this mixed mechanical electromagnetic oscillator. So the fact that we are using, uh, introducing mechanical degree of freedom is fundamental for localization. That's the key to breaking the diffraction limit. Diffraction limit gives you a limit to how much you can confine electromagnetic fields in vacuum. It's impossible, and I will be discussing that again. It's impossible to, to confine the electromagnetic energy in a volume smaller than lambda, lambda bars cube. As soon as you introduce some electrons, you can beat that. So, so, so that's why uh, plasmonics is so useful. Okay. So let me try to, uh, I just argue that if you are in vacuum, the electromagnetic field cannot be localized to sub-wavelength scales. So let me try to show that. So I'm looking for an oscillator So an electromagnetic oscillator and I'm trying to recover the diffraction limit. So the energy, electromagnetic energy, is the volume of the system. So Let's make the assumption that, uh, and this is a big assumption, so what I'm saying is not totally general, I'm making this assumption here. I'm saying there is only one length scale in the problem. So it's a cube or a sphere, whatever. There is one side, okay? And this is A cube. So my volume is A cube. It could be a different system, of course. So my discussion is limited to this case. Okay, and then I have essentially an electromagnetic energy, which is electric field plus magnetic field. So I'm writing explicitly the two, because if I'm looking for an oscillator, there must be two forms of energies, and that's what the oscillator is. Oscillation between form one and form two. If you take the standard mechanical harmonic oscillator, kinetic energy, potential energy. Here it's electric and magnetic. Okay. Now, what is the connection between E and B? It's given by uh, Maxwell's equation. So in terms of orders of magnitude, the derivative of E, if there is an, a single length scale, is given by E divided by A. And it has to be omega over B, if I'm looking for a harmonic oscillator at a given frequency omega. So you see that B is on the order of E over omega A. So that gives, if I plug this here, so no, I, I don't need to plug actually. Uh, I just want to make the case now that if there is an oscillator, the energy is oscillating between the two. So the amount of energy that you have on one form is equal to the amount of energy that you have in the other form. So that means that this epsilon e square over 2 is equal to this one, b, but b is here, e square over omega square a square, 1 over 2 mu naught. And these two are equivalent. So you see that you can simplify by e square, and you end up with the fact that omega square uh, a square, epsilon zero mu zero, which is omega over C A square, is on the order of one. So that that tells you that the size of the volume, if you want to have an oscillator, has to be on the order of lambda over two pi, which is, as you know, the smallest distance possible between two mirrors when you have a fabricable. That that that's the minimum mode. Okay. Uh, so that's a form of diffraction limit. 
So the point I want to make now is that just before I've beaten that the, the part particle, the plasmonic particle, I made no assumption regarding its size, and it worked. It was independent of the size. Okay? So the question is, what's happening? Why do I have an electromagnetic oscillator which is much smaller than the wavelength with the electrons? So let's go back to what I just did before, and let's try to understand why we're bidding this argument here. So we had M um, plus N e square over epsilon naught X equal to zero. So if you multiply by, so if we look, if we want to think in terms of energy, you multiply by X dot and you immediately find energy conservation. So this is the kinetic energy that's coming from here, and here you have this term, which looks like potential energy, okay? So you multiply by time derivative of x, you integrate, and, and you get that. Now, we can interpret this as follows. I can multiply by the number of electrons times uh, a cube if the size of the the cube is A. And that would be the total kinetic energy of the system. Plus this contribution here. And that's the energy, the total energy of the system. Um, let me look at the picture again okay now I would like you to suggest to me if this can be interpreted as an LC circuit is there some capacitance is there some inductance here do you see inductance do you see a capacitance Here we have a surface charge. Here we have a surface charge opposite. This is a capacitor. And separated by a distance. What is the charge? We, we said that the charge was NEx. If I multiply by A square, that's the charge. So essentially here you see that this N square, E square, X square, it's here. So that looks like Q squared, this term here, right? So that looks like the energy of a capacitor, which makes sense. It looks like a capacitor if you look at it. So, so what's the other term then? We would like to say it's the magnetic energy. It's uh, the inductance times the current. If we want, if we're seeking an LC circuit. But what it is, look at it, it's kinetic energy. So what plays the role of the inductance is the inertia of the electrons. If, if we were in vacuum, no electrons, no kinetic, no inertia, no kinetic energy, you need to find the room to fit the magnetic field, and you need a lot of room to fill all the energy in the form of the magnetic field. But if you get rid of it, there is a little bit of magnetic energy. There is a little bit of magnetic f energy going around, but, but it's very tiny. It's almost negligible. You have this kinetic energy which does the job, okay? And it takes almost all the energy. So, so that's the key. That, that's why you need electron, you need matter to play this role in the oscillator. So you can rewrite this in terms of one half of L I square. And you can work out the kinetic contribution due to the mass of the electrons to the inductance. So it's a kinetic inductance. Okay, it's just a matter of rewriting that. Of course, what is I? I is the current density times the area, it's the flux. And what is the current density? It's N E X dot. 
okay? That's uh, the velocity of the electron, the charge, number of charge. So this is rho, rho x dot times a square. So this is where you, you, you can rewrite everything. Here you have x dot. So you can replace x dot by this, and everything is in terms of intensity and therefore in terms of inductance. So I leave it as an example. Yes? But if I take a, a real empty process, it can, of course, be much smaller than the wavelength. Yes, absolutely, always, most of the time. But, but then uh, I would still say that the L is really magnetic and the C is really electric. And so, so what is the, you know, I, I don't need to have, I mean, in, in superconducting electric effect, we do have a kinetic induction, but it can be very small. And so yeah, so the question now is wha wha what, about the you, you, what about the confinement of the magnetic field? So yeah. the electric field can be confined. Uh, usually what happens uh, is, so, so I, I totally agree with what you said, and totally what happens, usually what happens is that the, uh, if you have an LC circuit, um, le let's take a, a split ring resonator for instance, so this is just a metallic wire, a single wire. So the electric energy in terms of field is localized here because here you have plus, this is minus, and all the electric field is highly localized here. Now this is a wire. You have a, an intensity flowing here, and we know that the magnetic field is like that. But you see that it's over all this volume. Okay? So the magnetic field is not localized at all, and the electric field is totally localized in, in this case. So we are separating the, um, uh, and, and uh, if, for instance, if you take a, a solenoid, if you take a solenoid and a capacitor, uh, this is the volume of the magnetic field here inside, and this is the volume of the electric field. So in, in this type of systems, the electric field is more confined. Yes, but but, but, but the, uh, the whole, uh, Yes, yes, yes. The total system is smaller. I, yes, but but in but but it's not vacuum. I fully agree with you, but it's not vacuum. My point is that if you are only in vacuum, you cannot make it. I totally agree with what you say. No. Okay. 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 So I agree. So so my argument is I need some matter. Yes, you say. No, I I. I Thank you. I, I don't mean it has to be kinetic energy. For plasma, the trick is kinetic energy of the electrons. In general, as, as, uh, if you want to beat diffraction limit, in general, you need some material structure. Uh, and, and that's exactly what happened for a standard LC circuit. And my point was it's impossible in vacuum. Questions? That clear? Okay, so now I move to a um, bigger system. I introduce, um, so that was localized plasmons. So now I go to propagating plasmons. And before moving to surface plasmon, I just discuss bulk plasmon. So, so that's what a plasmon is, basically. And again, uh, I'm discussing the concept of polarity here. That, that's the main take home message of this slide. So what I'm plotting here is essentially uh, a, charge, a density wave. So the, the, the density wave you are used to is acoustic wave. And you know that it's a density wave, okay? Okay, so that's exactly a density, an acoustic wave in a gas, electron gas. So here we have plenty of electrons. It's a density wave, plenty of electrons, plenty of electrons, plenty of electrons, and depletion of electrons, so positive charge is left behind, okay? So this is just a mechanical acoustic wave. But now what happens? Because this is positive and this is negative, all the charges see the electric field. There is an electric field, which is a pure electrostatic field in the framework of the wave. It's a totally electrostatic field in the framework of the wave, okay? And that's a polariton. Again, it's a mechanical wave in a charge system, so automatically it does generate an electromagnetic field. So they are coupled, that's all. So you can write this, you can study this either with Maxwell's equations or with hydrodynamic uh, fluid mechanics equations. 
bus works. When you do hydrodynamics, you need to put some electric force. When you do Maxwell's equation, you need some permittivity, and that permittivity depends on the material properties. So both uh, point of view have to end up with the same solution, which is this. This is a longitudinal solution. This is not, so you, you, many of you learn in class that electromagnetic waves are transverse. This is the wave vector. The electric field has to be transverse. This is not always true. And this is a neutral medium. There is no net charge in this medium. It's a neutral medium. But it's a longitudinal wave. OK? So this equation is, this system is ruled by the dispersion relation, the electromagnetic dispersion of this equation is given by divergence of D. That would be external or net charge. So this is zero. There is no external charge. So this is zero. So that gives you I k dot uh, epsilon r of omega times uh, E equals zero. And if you want to have a k dot E, so the longitudinal part, which is non-zero, then this guy has to be equal to zero. That's the dispersion relation of a longitudinal wave, epsilon equals zero. And that brings me to the model for this guy with the Drude model. And uh, we will see that, indeed, at omega p, uh, this is uh, satisfied. Yes? Uh, it's a bulk plasma, no surface wave so far. No, no, I, I, I'm just saying, imagine an acoustic wave in an electron gas. It's an electron gas. So if it's an electron gas, all the electrons are moving. I didn't mention that. All the electrons are moving. All the gelium, all of the positive background, the ions are not moving. So when the electrons are accumulating here, you have a negative charge. And uh, since they are no longer here, there is still the positive background charge. Well, as soon as you have a negative charge here and there's a positive charge here, there must be an electric field. That's all. I, I'm not telling you how I'm exciting this. I'm just looking for the existence of a mode of that system. OK, that's all. Just by analogy with an acoustic one. OK, so now I'm discussing the, the structure of the surface plasma. So the surface plasma is similar to what I've just discussed, but there is a, a huge difference. It's a transverse wave. It's not a longitudinal wave. It's a transverse wave. So this k dot e is 0. OK, for a surface plasma, I have divergence of e equals 0. I have it because this is what I'm looking for. The modes can be either transverse or uh, longitudinal. What I mean is that I can have either k dot e equal to 0 or k dot cross e equal to 0. That, 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 that's what the type of modes I'm looking for. I decide that I'm studying that type or that type. So it's a transverse mode, the surface plasma. So, so the bulk plasma is longitudinal, but the tr surface plasma is when you are seeking a transverse solution. That's all. It's by definition. You are seeking such a type of solution. So don't be confused by the fact that the bulk plasma is longitudinal. OK, so now you have this surface charge, which is a surface density of wave, as I said. So of course, the, the electric field goes like that and goes like that here. So at some point, since this is vacuum, there are no charges. They cannot go anywhere, these lines. So they have to make a turn around, which means that What's the type of polarization of this surface wave? I, if you stay here and time is moving, this guy is propagating. I'm here, and this is moving. What type of polarization do I see here? 
circular, yes, elliptic in general. They are not necessarily equal, so elliptic polarization with a longitudinal component. It's propagating like that, and there is a component like that, okay? It has to be. So now, if you want to characterize that polarization, what do you do? You just say that it's a divergence of E0. So you write that. So that gives you I k E sub x plus I gamma E sub z equals 0. Uh, so you can get rid of this I. And this gamma, remember, it was I modulus of gamma. So you see that E x over E z is minus uh, I modulus of gamma over k. So this I tells you that it's elliptic, right? So here you have the structure and the ratio of these two components. It's important to know what's the normal component, what's the transverse, and which one is the larger. And, and you see that it highly depends on k, the wave vector. So there is one k such that it's circular. OK, so that's the strange polarization of this guy. Um, so this condition for surface wave amount I already discussed. This is when k is larger than omega over c, so that we, we have exponential decay. OK, so I, I just introduced this evanescent wave. Before, I would like to give you another picture about what is near field and what is um, the connection with evanescent waves. So this is a, a second way of discussing what is near field. So I start with a single dipole. And I'm just plotting the field generated by this dipole. So of course it looks like a totally particular case, but since here in this room anything can be decomposed in sub-wavelength volumes, and any sub-wavelength volume can be described as a dipole, any field is due to the linear superposition of fields emitted by dipoles, because Maxwell's equation solved them. So this is totally general. If we learn something from this picture, then it has to be general. Okay, so we have a dipole here, and I'm plotting the field. So, so this is the standard field generated by an electro electric dipole. So it looks like that, and uh, uh, as you already said, there is this one over R. So this is the spherical wave, there is one R here. So with this guy, we have a one over R cube contribution, one over R square, and the one over R, the far field. So this is the far field contribution, the only one that survives in the far field. And this is the one that uh, is important in the near field. So from that picture, what is the definition of near field? I would say that it's when this term dominates. Okay, when R is small, this is the leading term. So what is the condition to make this and this negligible as compared to that one? We want k not r very small. Okay, and if k not r is very small, that means that you are talking about distances from the source, which are much smaller than lambda over two pi. Remember this two pi that we already have seen, lambda over two pi. So it's it's not smaller as compared to lambda. This is not near field. I, if you are at a distance of lambda, look look at the picture. This is lambda. This is a dipole. When you look at here, at the distance which is lambda divided by 20, you have this. Can you understand this picture? It's quite easy. This way of plotting the fields is not usual, so you probably don't recognize. That's the field. You know that the electric field lines are like that. OK? You all agree? So now I'm looking at a distance z here. So where are the lines packed together here and here? This is those guys. OK? So that's the electrostatic dipole. So what I'm saying, I'm saying that at short distance in the near field, 
we have an electrostatic dipole. And that this is indeed the electrostatic dipole. Can we check that it's really the electrostatic dipole? What is electrostatic dipole? It's when omega is zero, okay? And K naught here stands for omega over C. So if omega is zero, K naught is zero. Or is K naught, it's here, so no dephasing, of course, no phase variation. K naught is zero here, oh, but it cancels with this one. So K naught is zero, this guy is zero, this guy is zero, this one survives. And that's exactly the electrostatic dipole. So that formula is valid for omega equals zero. So what I've just said before is that if I'm looking at a small distance, the electromagnetic field is the electrostatic field. Good. So I can use electrostatics to know what's the distribution of the electric field in the near field. Now I can say something else. Uh, let's pretend I want to neglect retardation effects. So phase differences due to propagation. So I want this term to be negligible, right? So it's the same condition. So non-retarded, electrostatic, or near field, they are one and the same, okay? So this is important to, to have this in mind. And with that, you can compute the structure of the electromagnetic field in the near field. You, you, you can use electrostatics. Which, by the way, means that you can, uh, if you're in the electrostatic regime, you can separate magnetic energy from electric energy, as usual. Okay, and the other thing that we learn is that at a distance of a wavelength, this is the Eri function. Okay, so after one wavelength, you are already in the far field. The image of a point is the Eri function after one micron, one wavelength. Okay, so, so keep in mind this 2 pi I was mentioning, at a wavelength, you have lost all the evanescent wave. So you can tell the story in terms of one over R cube larger than one over R, or in terms of big distance as compared to the decay length of the evanescent wave. Okay, that, that, that's the point I wanted to make. The other point I wanted to make is that evanescent waves are um, really a mode uh, usually there is a, 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 an idea that I want to kill because it's impractical. The first time a student encounters a venescent wave usually is in total internal reflection or <coughs> the field in the skin depths. So you have this exponential leaking and it's so-called evanescent wave. That's not what I mean here by evanescent wave. Evanescent wave is just a mode and you don't, it's not a physical phenomenon, it's just a mode. Oops, uh, I think, uh, we sh je je I lost track of time, so. So we should uh, maybe have a 10 minute break? Good.
Merci. OK, so I was uh, saying that evanescent waves should be understood as modes. Uh, and uh, just to illustrate this point of view, I'm, I'm showing here a spherical wave. So the spherical wave can be viewed as the wave radiated by a point-like force. Okay. Um, you do have this divergence as 1 over r because of this, uh, the fact that it's point-like. Uh, as a consequence, uh, the field will vary very rapidly, will be highly confined, uh, close to the origin, but the with no particular length gain. Uh, you can derive this formula, and you see that essentially the spherical wave can be decomposed into an integral. So this integral should be understood as a double integral over kx and ky from minus infinity to plus infinity over all wave vectors in the plane xy. And this gamma here is given by what I got before, okay? It's given by the dispersion relation. So this gamma becomes uh, pure imaginary when the modulus of kx squared plus ky squared is larger than omega squared over c squared, okay? So that includes both propagating waves, the standard waves, and evanescent waves. And the evanescent waves are needed to reproduce this singularity, okay? So, so this is just to tell you that um, this is just a basis, a basis that has the standard propagating plane waves and also the evanescent waves. It's just a basis to describe any field. Okay? So there is no physics associated with the concept of evanescent waves. And then, of course, there are plenty of physical systems where you do have fields that decay exponentially that we call also evanescent waves. But those are two different things. Now, I would like to look at the dispersion relation of these two surface plasmas, the localized one and the propagating one. And uh, of course, you can look for the modes of the system. There is another way to find this dispersion relation, which is to look at the linear response of the system. So here, a linear response to an incident electric field would be the Fresnel reflection factor. If you send an incident field, you have a response which is a reflection, or it could be the transmission. And here, you have the polarizability. Now, the mode will correspond to the divergence of the linear response. So you see that the dispersion relation for the localized mode is epsilon plus 2 equals 0 for, for that sphere. And here, for this plus 1, it's given by the fact that the denominator of the Fresnel reflection factor should be 0. Sorry for the notation here. I'm using kz. It's the same as the gamma, actually. It, um, just uh, uh, copy-paste with different connotations. I apologize for that. Um, so uh, it doesn't look like an obvious dispersion relation where you would like to see k and omega. So let me just write it for you here. Um, so we have epsilon 2 kz2 equal minus epsilon 1 kz1. So you take the square of that. And of course, if I take the square, I lose the sign, which is the difference between numerator and denominator. So by losing the sign, I'm actually looking at the solution of numerator equals 0 and denominator equals 0. So I get twice more solution than what I'm, what I'm looking for. So there will be two branches. And one of them has nothing to do with surface plasma. So epsilon 2 square. So this kz square was. Uh, no, this is one here. Just two. So this kz1 square is epsilon 1 omega square over c square minus k2. Okay, before when I wrote, I was in vacuum. So the dielectric constant was 1 here, the relative dielectric constant. Now I'm in medium 1. So this omega square over c square is multiplied by, it's not c, but c divided by n square, which is permitted. And now we have epsilon 1 square times epsilon 2 omega square over c square minus k2. So you can group the k together. And uh, uh, when you do that, at the end of the day, you find omega square omega over c square root of epsilon 1 epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2. Um, 
uh, and that looks like a dispersion relation. If you, one of the two is vacuum, you get K equal omega over C, and then you get uh, epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2. Um, if epsilon y is 1, just. So, so that would be the typical case for air metal, for instance. So this is the standard dispersion relation. I, I'll show the, the, how it looks like. Um, an important thing is that uh, we want a surface wave. So this k has to be larger than omega over c. So this square root has to be larger than omega over c. So if epsilon 2 is a positive number, it will never work. So epsilon 2 has to be, for instance, a negative real number. So forget about dielectric at low frequencies, which are always real positive numbers. Here we're in optics regime, and the metal will have a negative permittivity. So we need some information about permittivity of metals. So that's the Druid model. You see that uh, permittivity is roughly this one is can be fitted by a different number this is a simple slim, sim, simplest model accounting only for the contribution of the electrons and you see minus omega p square the, this plasma frequency of course it has to be here omega square and this is a l the loss term if you forget the losses you see that this epsilon is one minus something and uh, depending whether omega is larger and smaller than omega p you end up with a negative number or a positive number. If it's positive, it's dielectric-like. If it's negative, then it's a metal-like. And if it's negative, the wave cannot penetrate. Because, as you know, the uh, refractive index n square is epsilon, and this, if this is negative, then is n i modulus of epsilon r, and your refractive index would be pure imaginary, so you have a pure exponentially decaying wave. Okay, so, so negative number means that the wave cannot penetrate, and this uh, imaginary part of the refractive index gives you the skin depth, essentially. Um, so now I would also like to discuss this dispersion relation, which is valid for all frequencies here. Uh, let me show the, sorry, yeah. So le le let's take a look here at, this dis at the form of the dispersion relation, which is here. Uh, <coughs> uh, I told you that I was expecting two branches because I lost track of this sign. And uh, here we have a branch which is above one, and the frequency here has been normalized by plasma frequency. So this is the dielectric regime. This is the regime of frequencies where your metal is actually a dielectric. It has a positive real permittivity, neglecting loss, for the sake of simplicity. So this is uh, the solution of the zero, the numerator equals zero, and that, that's called Broster angle. Okay? So, so this is not a branch of the plasmon. Yeah, many times you see that it, it, it has nothing to do. It's just the Brewster angle. That's the surface plasma. That's the only one. Um, okay, so, let's, so now the question is, is it really a surface plasma when I'm looking at low frequencies? I have found a solution, which is a surface wave, definitely. Should I call it surface plasma? Well, in the beginning, when I was discussing the tiny particle, I was saying the surface plasmon is the oscillation of the electrons at the plasma frequency, and that's what the plasmon is. Uh, when I go to very low frequencies, uh, let's take a look now at the model. Here, let's take a look at the Druid model. If the frequency is very low, and by low I mean smaller than something, it doesn't mean anything small omega. So if omega is smaller than gamma, which is the damping rate, so typically the lifetime of your plasma of any wave, then you can neglect safely this term. And if you neglect this term, then you end up with epsilon r, which is one minus this divided by that. If you, it's a low frequency, then this is huge. So you can also neglect the one. So you end up with epsilon, which is essentially this, and that's the, the low frequency regime. And you see that the epsilon is pure imaginary, so it's a very lossy term. 
th there is no more oscillation. The oscillations were coming from this term. They are gone. It's over. I your electron is in a, is in a honey pot. Okay, no oscillations at all. So it's not, you can call it surface plasma by continuity. It's the same surface wave. But this oscill typical oscillation regime of the electrons, it's not there. So keep that in mind. It's actually a surface wave which looks like the radio waves. You are in the limit low frequencies. It is a surface wave, but there are no oscillations at all. No, so no resonance of the system, no resonant contribution of the electrons. Okay, um, so this gamma here, this is a phenomenological parameter, what it stands for. So what are the lossy mechanisms? Um, so here I want to draw your attention to the fact that this gamma, th th this formula can be used to fit the parameters uh, from radio frequencies to optical frequencies. The point I want to make is that you, I'm sure you learn that uh, when you increase temperature, resistance increases. Uh, and uh, therefore, if I rephrase, as I decay, as decrease the temperature, you decrease the resistance, and therefore, you will hope that gamma decreases. And uh, you can even take a look at the data at DC frequencies, and it's this conductivity here, which is directly related to the gamma, which is here, okay? You find this conductivity, which is the DC conductivity, and it's extremely tempting to say, okay, this sigma is related to this gamma, so I know the gamma. But if you take DC uh, values, uh, the physical phenomena which are involved in producing dissipation in DC regime has, strictly speaking, nothing to do with the me physical mechanism that produces dissipation at optical regime. So, so this formula is extremely misleading. So, so this is what, so, and in particular, if you know the temperature variation of this guy at DC, you know nothing about temperature variation of the losses in the optical regime. Okay, I, I, I want to to emphasize the fact that. This formula is very misleading. Uh, so that, that's what are the physical mechanisms uh, uh, in optics. Uh, uh, losses are due to uh, a transition. It's intraband transition, what is described by this parameter. And uh, you see that if you want to absorb uh, some electromagnetic quantum, a photon, then it's uh, essentially a vertical transition and, and you are no longer on, the, on your band structure, so, so you need to be assisted by emitting photons or absorbing photons. Those are the different uh, mechanisms. This is intraband. Uh, there is another term which is not described by the parameter gamma, which is interband. So to explain what interband means, I'm showing a band structure of silver here. Uh, this is the Fermi level, so this is where your electrons are. So if you look, for instance, at that particular uh, band structure here, uh, an intraband mechanism would be from here to here, and an interband would be to have a higher energy photon, and you would be uh, able to excite an electron which is here and bring it to that free state. Okay, that would be interband. So interband will take place with some threshold in energy. And that's exactly what you see here for gold, that that's what is responsible for the color of gold and copper, it's interband absorption. So if you look here at this imaginary part of the permittivity, that would be a druid model, this line here, it, it goes like this power typical of druid model. And here you have that structure which is due to the interband absorption, okay? So it has to do with the D bands, so-called D bands. So keep in mind that this Druid model does not describe interband absorption. So, so again, uh, you have to have this in mind. Good. So now that's the dispersion relation. Uh, what do we learn from this uh, structure? First of all, um, in real life, um, you need to account for losses. So here, epsilon is complex. So if you look for a solution where k is real and omega is real, you won't get it because this is complex. So you cannot find a solution for the dispersion relation looking real K and real omega. So then you have to make a choice. Um, so, so what choice should we make? Well, there are two choices. So this is something which is 
very confusing in the literature. So the first choice is I'm dealing with a waveguide problem. I'm looking at the propagation of a wave here, and here I have a laser with real frequency, which is forcing the system at a real frequency. That's why I have a source. And uh, I, I'm looking at the evolution of the wave here. So in that case, omega, the, the problem is from the beginning with real omega, because I decided that I was driving the system with a real frequency. So your Maxwell's equations, you look a solution with real omega right from the beginning. So this is called Helmholtz equation, actually. So your unknown is a field which is a function of x, y, z, and omega. And omega is real and imposed by your system. So then, of course, omega is real, and you look for a complex case. So you just plot omega here, everything. This is the easy case, and you get a complex case. Now, you could argue that you have a system like my small sphere. And I ask the question, what is the mode of that sphere? Just like when I ask the question, I have a tuning fork. Uh, you know, tuning fork at 440 hertz. And I ask the question, what's the resonance frequency of that oscillator? It's a damped oscillator. So you look for the solution, and uh, you find a complex frequency. And the imaging part of the complex frequency gives you the lifetime of the oscillator. So it's not strictly speaking a mode, because it's lossy. Uh, you are no longer in the Hermitian framework and, and all that stuff. So it's called quasi-normal mode or virtual mode, or there are different names, just to try to explain that it has losses and it's a complex frequency. But this mode is, is really the mode of the equations in time domain. So this is the same as the state in quantum mechanics. You are in time domain and you look for the state of the system. If the system is Hermitian, it's you find the stationary states and you are happy with that. And when it comes to counting how many states we have, Remy has been insisting on density of states and counting states. We, we, what is the choice? The choice is complex frequency. Okay. And that matters, because look at the shape of the dispersion relation, whether you make the choice complex omega or complex k. You see here, no states, a band gap, and here, I have states. So if you try to, and you look at that, this is infinite. I do have solutions with arbitrary large k, and here there is a cutoff. So all the conclusions on the potential, on the modes of that system, truly depend on your choice. Okay? So here density of states is diverges, is infinite. Here it's not. So, so which one should I use for computing density of states? According to what I've said, that one, complex omega. Just like when you look at the modes of uh, any finite size oscillator, it has a complex frequency. So this one you use for computing density of states and therefore computing energy of the system in thermodynamic equilibrium, uh, computing uh, Fermi-Golden rule. Uh, this is the one. Okay, questions? This is rather subtle. Is that, does it make sense what I've told you? Is that clear? So far it's very unclear in the literature. So don't hesitate in asking questions. Uh, the lazy solution is real omega because when you say complex omega, then this, you need to use this guy to find K. And uh, well, if you have a Druid model, you have an analytic form, so it's not very difficult to insert in an analytic form a complex frequency. But if you just have data, it's much more involved to find an analytic form, okay? You need to feed the data with an analytic form and use that. So it's much more involved. So most of the time, people don't do it because it's too complicated. But for some things, you have to. Good. Um, so now I would like to discuss length scales. So 
Um, I'm looking at, I'm showing here different wavelengths. So this is for gold. It's a simple interface. So it's like, this is gold, a big piece of gold, and vacuum, okay? And we're discussing typical lens scales. So delta x is, assuming that I have a real frequency, uh, what's the decay lens uh, along the propagation? So here, uh, if I, you are at helium neon laser, it's 10 micron. So you see not much. If you go to 10 microns, this is almost 40,000 microns, so 40 millimeters, and then it becomes huge uh, when you go to infrared at 36 microns, which is typical of vibrations. The G1 is the decay in error, and the G2 is the decay in the metal. So in the metal is the skin depth, and the skin depth is essentially ruled by the refractive index. So that's why it's constant. Uh, if, if you use the Drude model uh, and, and you see the omega compensates then, and, uh, and, and you end up with, for gold, typically 14 nanometers. So this, this skin depth in, in gold is always the same. By contrast, in air, you see that it's, it varies dramatically. And when you, ha you are in the infrared at 36 micron, you see that this lens scale is very large. So that means that it's no longer confined. So can you establish a connection between the fact that it's no longer confined in vacuum, still confined in gold, and uh, there is essentially no more losses? It can propagate over very large distances. This is a, a very important question because you see that here, I, what I'm saying is that if this is gold, I have helium neon, I'm, sh I'm launching a surface plasmon. It will provide for 10 microns, which is not a lot. So this is kind of disappointing. And that, that's the problem, the permanent problem of plasmonics. Um, if you, I was showing beautiful gu wave guiding in the beginning and I'm telling you that it's very nice. But of course, if the total length is only on the order of 20, 30 microns, that's a serious limitation. So here we're learning that maybe there is some hop to get much more. So we should understand why this number is so large. So let me make a drawing. So this is gold. And now we have uh, this red plasmon. And then we have an infrared plasmon, which has the same decay in gold. But now, that's the structure of the field in vacuum. So what fraction of the electromagnetic energy, if I normalized the mode, what fraction of the electromagnetic energy, so that would be 36 micron. This is helium, na laser, helium neon. I want to discuss the fraction of energy which is in vacuum and therefore does not pay taxes. Taxes is losses. Okay, things of the GAFA. Where do they put their money? Where they pay taxes or where they don't pay taxes? This guy is evading taxes because this guy has 99% of his income in a non, in a country without taxes. And this guy is paying a lot of taxes, okay? The fraction of, that, that, that's the key. So what's the solution, the general, wh what we learn from that, the general solution to reduce losses is to do have some metal structure, but also dielectric, and to try to engineer the mode in such a way that most of the volume of the mode, most of the energy of the mode, is in the dielectric part of the structure, okay? So instead of having a bulk gold, you could have, for instance, a thin metallic layer and then dielectric and dielectric 
and you can find a trick to have more energy here. Or you could have a tiny structure on top of a big dielectric structure with a dielectric mode here. So you will have a coupled plasmon mode here and dielectric mode here in a waveguide dielectric. Here, because of the metal, you have a huge confinement of the field over here, but most of the energy of the mode is in the dielectric. Okay? That, that's the basic idea. If you haven't understood that, that that's all. Th then you can try many, many different systems, but that's the basic idea. That's the only idea. So this is hybrid metal or dielectric. That's the key. Okay? Questions? So that's what we learned from that, but it's a general concept. OK, now we'd like to discuss scattering. Um, so most of you have seen that, I guess. OK, I'm not sure everybody can explain that. Because most of you have seen that also. This one is in Notre Dame. You can also go to Notre, uh, La Sainte-Chapelle in Paris also. The red here in the stained glass is due to particles. Now, this guy is red in transmission and green in reflection. What about those? They are red in transmission and in reflection, right? Stained glass has the same color. It's just like ink. So, both are due to metallic nanoparticles from surface plasma resonances. So what's the difference? Because there is a difference, obviously. The size, the size yes. And uh, which one is small, which one is large? Uh, which one is, the this one is small? Yes. Why? Yes, so this is absolutely true, what you just said, and this is exactly like the sunset. When light goes through the atmosphere, you have scattering. You can look at the sun in transmission through the atmosphere, it's red, reddish, and if you look the scattered light in the sky, it's blue, greenish. So this is scattering. So then that would be absorption, right? And indeed, when you have ink on the slide and you're writing, it's pure absorption due to pigments. And when you have pure absorption, it's, it gives the same color. So that would be absorption, and that would be scattering, definitely. Now, the question is, which one, who is who? So if I have a tiny particle, very tiny, in the limit where it goes to zero, what does it do? Does it absorb or does it scatter? So the question I'm asking is scattering cross-section versus absorption cross-section. How they depend on the size of the particle. So let's write it. What is absorption? Scattering absorption. S scattering or, s sorry, absorption cross-section. This is the power absorb. What is the power absorb? So divided by the incident flux. And what is the power absorbed is the integral over the volume of the particle of J dot E. Okay, that's the rate of absorption in the volume. And this is, this J is essentially uh, epsilon zero, epsilon R minus one, minus i omega e, so this is j, okay, that's the electric field, that times e is the polarization, and this is the time derivative of the polarization, which is the current, current is time derivative of polarization, okay, so we take one half of real part of one times complex conjugate, and you integrate so this is not, so you see that this goes like the volume 
Okay, this is not dependent, the, it's only the integral with the volume that you have here. Now, if what is the cross section, scattering cross section? This is the power scattered divided by the incident flux. Okay, divided. And uh, what's the scattered power by a dipole? So it's the radiated power, right? You, the, the scattered is you incident field induces a dipole and the dipole radiates. So what's the radiation of a dipole, the power radiated by a dipole? Larmor formula, does it ring a bell? It goes like omega 4, this is I'm sure you remember. And p square, that's what we're looking for, dipole moment. And those are the factors. But that's, that's what we're looking for, dipole moment. And this dipole moment, the dipole moment, P is alpha polarizability times epsilon naught E. And this polarizability is uh, 4 pi A cubed, the volume. I was writing that before, previously. So this polarizability goes like the volume. Essentially, the polarizability goes like the number of dipoles, right? the number of particles. So polarizability square goes like the volume square. So sigma scattering is proportional to volume square. So when volume goes to zero, Radiation losses goes to zero, scattering goes to zero, and you're left with absorption. Okay, a way to remember that, what's the best absorber you can think of? China ink. What is China ink? It's a suspension in water of aggregates, fractal aggregates of carbon nanoparticles, nanometer scale. Okay, that, that's what is China ink. It's extremely small particles. They can absorb, they cannot scatter. They cannot scatter because they are so small. You know, if you want to radiate, you need a bunch of electrons, P square, and P is number of electrons. So if you want to radiate, what do you do? You increase the size. And another way to remember that is take your nanoparticle, and increase the size, it becomes the World Cup, silver World Cup. It reflects everything. It's a mirror. It doesn't absorb. Okay? So if it's big, it scatters. If it's small, it absorbs. For that reason. So you can measure that by introducing a dimensionless number, which is the albedo from alba, which means white in Latin. So this is a degree of whiteness. And it's defined as the ratio of the scattering cross-section divided by the extinction cross-section, which is the sum of these two. So if this absorption is negligible, this is one. And if absorption is huge, this is zero. So this is number, which is one if it's white, and it's zero if it's black. Okay? And this is how it behaves. And the, the, the take a look here. You see that as soon as it's larger than 150 nanometers, uh, essentially, it's, uh, there are no more losses. Everything is radiated. It becomes an excellent radiator. So this is the radius. So that means that this is for lambda equal 1,000 nanometers. We're talking about a diameter which is about uh, lambda over 2, lambda over 4. Uh, when it's small, pure absorption. So here, scattering, big particles. Absorption, small particles. So they made progress in nanotechnology between the Romans and the Middle Age. They make it smaller. Okay? Okay, so this is shown here. Did yes? No, no, I'm talking about, well, wh what I'm saying here is true for all type of particles. The, the, this formula is valid, so you can plug any epsilon here. And this idea of volume dependence uh, is the same. Th this V dependence, you, you can plug any epsilon you want here. So this is valid for both. This idea, you, you can think in terms of dielectric antennas, the size matters. It's the same story. 
Okay, I'm coming back here f to some more details on absorption and scattering. So I'm, I'm plotting here for uh, silicon carbide particles. So silicon carbide here, it's, uh, it behaves as a plasmon, but it, it's, a, it's not a surface plasmon, it's a surface phonon. And the reason why epsilon is negative is that we are exciting a resonance, which is not due to electrons, but due to phonons. From the electromagnetic point of view, you have an epsilon, which is negative. It's the same. So you have the same resonances. And you can have a resonance when epsilon equal minus 2. Uh, and uh, you can look at the scattering cross-section and absorption cross-section of spheres of this material. So here I'm plotting for three different sizes. Uh, here it's below uh, the optimum. <coughs> I'm plotting the absorption cross-section and the scattering cross-section normalized by 3 lambda over 8 pi. So this is uh, similar to the number that Darik was using, but I'm using 8 pi instead of 2 pi. Um, the extinction is the sum of both. So if it, the particle is um, small, we are in a regime where the absorption is larger than the scattering. Then as you increase the size, the uh, scattering will catch up. And here, the losses of the mode are due equally to radiation losses and ohmic losses. And this is the case where you reach the optimum, the maximum absorption. And uh, then if you keep increasing the size, then this scattering shifts here and it approaches the value that was, here I have a factor of four. So now this is the value given by Darik. So that particle with losses, if it's big enough, it starts behaving as there were no losses. Because radiation losses take over. So ohmic losses don't matter anymore. And then you reach this, uh, the same uh, op fundamental value of the extinction cross-section that you get with atoms where, of course, there is no losses. You cannot hit uh, internally the atoms. So at that point, it behaves like an atom. Apart from that, you see that these particles don't scatter more than an atom. The maximum due to the dipolar contribution is the same as an atom, which sounds quite surprising, right? Some other thing is you have this additional peak, what is this? It shows that as you increase the size, the deep dipolar approximation is no longer sufficient. You have other modes showing up. It has to be small so to make sure that dipole accounts for everything. This is a complete calculation, so you have other contributions. Now, coming back to this uh, question about cross-section, um, it, it, it's quite surprising to see that uh, a standard atom has the same cross-section that this particle. So is that really true? Actually, when you buy uh, in the pharmacy some uh, test for pregnancy, you detect some molecules, and uh, the way you detect these molecules is by having nanoparticles which are moved, and you can see them by the naked eye. If it were rubidium atoms, you wouldn't see by the naked eye. So there must be something wrong when I'm saying that this character as much, Al although it is true that the maximum cross-section is the same. So the answer to this paradox I'm trying to build, just to confuse you, <laughs> actually my goal is to make sure that you will remember that. Uh, how do I shine light on the system? If I'm using a laser, it is true that an atom scatters as much as a particle. But if I'm using white light, if I'm using white light, the atom will scatter a fraction of the incident light, which is totally ridiculous because it's extremely narrow band, the atom. 
So it will scatter a ridiculous fraction of the incident light because I'm using white light. In contrast, this metallic nanoparticle, it will scatter it will scatter about 25% of your incident light. Well, it depends on what type of white light you're using. If you are using the sunlight, uh, your, your, uh, the Q factor is typically 10 for a metallic nanoparticle. So, so you are scattering typically between 600 and 700, okay? It's 100 nanometers as opposed to basically nothing. So, so that's why it makes a tremendous difference if you illuminate with white light, but if you illuminate with a laser, it doesn't make any difference. Okay, so the particle does scatter much more in the sense that it's broader. And the fact that it's broader is because the decay rate is amazingly fast. And the decay rate is amazingly fast because you don't have one poor electron trying to connect with plane waves, but you have millions of electrons all oscillating. So the dipole moment is huge and it goes like the square, okay? So it's orders of magnitude larger. So it's really a super radiance phenomenon, a classical super radiance phenomenon. Think of the particle, think of the atom as one, uh, classically, as one electron oscillating. Think of the metallic nanoparticle as billions of electrons oscillating together. You add these billions, you take the square, uh, uh, uh. And of course, the power radiated is much larger, therefore the decay rate is much smaller. And if the decay rate is smaller, the bandwidth is huge. Okay? So most of, uh, so this decay rate, and that, that's one of the fundamental properties of these uh, plasmons. They have a relative decay rate which is extremely small so that make band broadband devices, but extremely fast devices. Okay, one more minute. Uh, I'll stop after that one. So this is just to show that by tailoring the shape of these uh, gold nanoparticles, you can change the resonances. I just gave uh, uh, the example. No, I didn't mention that. I want um, so. You, you can look for the sphere, actually. You, you, uh, I, I, I look at the resonance for the cube. If you look at the resonance for the sphere, you, you have a, a, a different factor. If you plug Jude model here, you will find omega p divided by square root of three. This is an example. Uh, you can engineer particles, and by changing this ratio, this geometric ratio, you can change the position of the absorption uh, spectrum. So you can also modify the environment I if you uh, insert these nanoparticles into dielectric medium. You also change the surface charge, and then by changing the surface charge, from our cal first calculation, you can guess that this restoring force changes, and therefore the resonance frequency changes. So you can tune these resonance frequencies by uh, both uh, engineering the shape and engineering the environment of these particles. Okay, uh, I'll stop at that point. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Is there any uh, Yes, so me scattering is, uh, so Gustav me is the person who solved the scattering by a sphere. So it's the complete rigorous solution of scattering of a plane wave by a sphere. And uh, when you do that, you expand the field over spherical harmonics. And the lowest contribution is the dipolar contribution, which I was discussing here. But then you have all the multiples. And the speak I was showing before was one of these uh, higher order multiples. Uh, so the dipolar scattering is just the lowest, the contribution of the lowest multiple in the mean expansion. Other questions? Okay, see you tomorrow. <laughs>